Good evening, everyone. So this is a story of a 25-year-old lady from Andhra Pradesh. When she presented to CMC, she was at 22 weeks of gestation. She was a primate. She had first come to the hematology OPD with a history of um, being found to be anemic with a HP of 3 grams during her third month of pregnancy during a routine antenatal visit. At that time, the other evaluation showed that she had a total count of 3,800 and a platelet count of 22,000. She had received two units of transfusion, following which her hemoglobin had improved to six grams. She did not give history of easy fatigability, fetal edema, dyspnea and exertion or orthopnea. However, she did give history of easy bruciability and excessive bleeding following trivial trauma. There was no history of recurrent infections. There was no history of yellowish discoloration of eyes, joint pains, oral ulcers, or increased hair fall. Past history-wise, there was no history of any drug use. However, in 2010, she had history of being found to be anemic at that point with a hemoglobin of 2 grams, for which she was transfused, but was not evaluated further according to them. Treatment history-wise, for her present illness, she was evaluated outside initially, and she was found to be have a pancytopenia. A bone marrow was done outside, which showed a hypocellular marrow. And the differentials they had considered was a hypoplastic MDS, a hypoplastic marrow, or a megaloblastic anemia. She was last received her transfusion with three units of uh, packed red cells on 22-6-21. She presented to us one month later. Personal history, she was born of, to consanguineous parents and she had three sisters. On examination, her vitals were stable. She had pallor. There were no petechiae, no rash, no oral ulcers. There were no skeletal or morphological or nail changes to suggest a congenital cause of aplastic anemia. And her systemic examination was normal. Her initial investigations in CMC, her CBC profile, this was done on 15-7-21. Total count was 3,900. She had a neutrophil count of 31. HB was 9.8 grams. Platelet counts were 11,000. Reticulocyte count was 1.27 with a normal vitamin D and B, vitamin B12 and LDH levels. Her ferritin was on the high normal. Bone marrow in CMC, the smear showed a hypoplastic marrow and biopsy showed scanty hypercellular marrow marked decrease in trilinear hematopoiesis. So at 22 weeks, when she came, her HP was 9.2, platelets were 11,000. She then reviewed in the obstetrics OPD at 28 weeks of gestation, at which point her hemoglobin was 6.1, platelets were 7,000, total count of 1,800, and she had an ANC, absolute neutrophil count of 216. So our diagnosis was an aplastic anemia as she fulfilled the cat, uh, entry criteria of a bone marrow showing less than 25% cellularity. We assumed it to be idiopathic and as a flare during pregnancy, because there was history of a two gram hemoglobin 10 years prior. And she fulfilled the criteria of severe aplastic anemia as her platelet counts were less than 20,000, her ANC was less than 500, and her peripheral blood reticular sites counts were less than 20,000. So coming to aplastic anemia in pregnancy, uh, the first ever known that, I mean, uh, case report of aplastic anemia in 1888 was actually in a pregnant woman who died one month after her delivery. So a lot of review articles on aplastic anemia actually list pregnancy as a cause. However, there's no clear causal uh, association has been established yet. And the exact pathogenesis why pregnancy causes a flare in aplastic anemia is not known. However, there is clear evidence that aplastic anemia can worsen during pregnancy and post-delivery there is improvement of the same. Obstetric and neonatal complications can range from 12 to 33% and mortality is mainly due to hemorrhage and sepsis. Incidence of hemorrhage can be as high as 75% in those with thrombocytopenia. One case series looked at 61 patients and they compared severe thrombocytopenia with non-severe thrombocytopenia. And they found that in those with severe thrombocytopenia, there was an 11-fold increase in incidence of transfusion dependence in sepsis. There was a six-fold increase in incidence of preeclampsia, preterm delivery, IUGR, fetal and neonatal death. 
Infections in patients with aplastic anemia is one of the main causes of death. And one case series found that up to 81% of patients with aplastic anemia had developed infections of one point or other. And usually it occurred in the first two years since diagnosis. Another group looked at the risk factors for developing aplastic anemia and found that severe neutropenia with an ANC less than 500 was associated with higher risk of infection. As you can see on the left side, the kaplan mayer graph showing the a probability of a infection being much higher in those with ANC less than 500. Other complications in the obstetric side include premature rupture of membranes, preeclampsia, as I already mentioned, endometritis, subchorionic hematoma, placental abruption, and neonatal complications include growth restriction and neonatal sepsis. Coming to the management of aplastic anemia. So treatment options in any routine patient with aplastic anemia includes supportive management, antithymocyte globulin, cyclosporin, L-thrombopath, GCSF, and stem cell transplant. When it comes to pregnancy, most of these options can still be continued. However, stem cell is not an option. I will be going into details of each of these subsequently. So supportive management. So most forms of milder forms of aplastic anemia or moderate aplastic anemia, regardless of whether they're pregnant or not, warrants supportive management. And it is a treatment of choice in the milder form. So the Supportive managed warrants maintaining hemoglobin above 8 and a platelet count of more than 20,000. And at the time of delivery, a platelet count more than 50,000. Supportive management also includes giving appropriate antibiotics in those with low ANC or antifungal cover as required. And during pregnancy, since stem cell is not an option, to minimize the transfusion so there is no alloimmunization. Coming to l thrombopag, it is a thrombopoietin receptor agonist. It is used in ITP and aplastic anemia. And there's been a multi-center observation study on 13 pregnant patients who have been given l thrombopack. These were among interfractory ITP patients. And they showed there was a good improvement in platelet count without any reactive thrombocytosis in the neonate. There, so l thrombopack can be used in pregnancy and our hematology department here has used it in pregnant patients. However, the major limitation being it's an extremely expensive drug. Coming to antithymocyte globulin, um, in, in neural models, they have shown to have toxic, toxic effects, which manifested as a decrease in placental development. There are a few case reports of successful usage in pregnancy. However, they were rabbit antithymocyte globulin, and in aplastic anemia, horse antithymocyte is what is recommended. Anyway, in any patients, ATG usage is associated with risk of serum sickness. And as of now, it is not advisable in pregnancy. Coming to cyclosporin, there was a systematic review in 2013 for the role of cyclosporin in patients who are pregnant. They found that the incidence of the following were higher um, among those with use of cyclosporin, premature delivery, low birth weight, and hypertension. However, it is to be noted, and the reviewers are also mentioned, that most of these patients were post-transplant, being the indication for receiving cyclosporin. A more recent case series on patients who have autoimmune disease requiring cyclosporin did not show any harm. So as of now, cyclosporin can be used in pregnancy when the benefits outweigh the risk. CGSF can be used in pregnancy as well. There have been reports of patients being on long-term CGSF throughout pregnancy, or at least for a minimum of one complete trimester without showing any harm. Therefore, CGSF can be used in case of severe neutropenia. Hematopoietic stem cell transplant is the treatment of choice for severe aplastic anemia, and it has shown significant five-year survival rates in non-pregnant women. However, it is contraindicated during pregnancy because the pre-transplant immunosuppressive agents are teratogenic for the infant. Termination is not required because the patient can be brought to term using other immunosuppressive agents and stem cell transplant can be planned postpartum during the lactational period. So our patient, we had a multidisciplinary team discussion which consisted of the hematologists, the obstetricians, as well as the obstetric medicine team. So the plan given for her was we would continue to give her supportive management. 
and she was started on immunosuppressant after a discussion in terms of cost and feasibility. She was started on cyclosporin, 150 mg twice daily. That's at six uh, grams per kg at two divided doses with plans for close monitoring of her blood pressures, creatinine and potassium. She was planned for a trial of GCSF closer to delivery and she was planned for a HLA matching with one of her sisters. And if a match was found, she was planned for early termination of pregnancy, early, sorry, early delivery, early delivery followed by stem cell transplant, if not to deliver her by 34 weeks. She was advised to follow up weekly. She was last seen at 30 plus five weeks of gestation, as you can see here, at which point her hemoglobin is 5.9, platelets were 9,000. She was admitted and transfused one unit of Paxil's and two PRC's. However, she was lost to follow up after that particular admission. Fortunately for us and for her, she had continued her cyclosporin 150 mg. She came back to labor room at 33 plus two weeks of gestation with complaints of decreased fetal movements and a scan done showed IUGR. At admission, at this admission, her hemoglobin was 6.4 and platelets were 4,000. She was given one unit of Paxil's and two PRC's and she was given injection DEXA for fetal lung maturation. Subsequently, at 33 plus four weeks, she had an emergency LSAS under GA, indication being severe, IU, severe aplastic anemia and IUGR. Intraoperatively, she had a 800 ml blood loss and she required another Paxil and two PRCs. She delivered a single live baby, 1.64 kgs, and APTAR at one and five minutes of nine and nine. She, the baby was kept in the NICU. She received a further one unit of Paxil and PR2 PRCs in the post-operative period. Fortunately, she did not develop any infections. And at the time of discharge, her hemoglobin was 8.9 and platelet counts were 32,000. Unfortunately for her, so far, none of her siblings have matched. So she's continued on HLA, HLA I mean on cyclosporin, and is on follow-up with our hematology department. The take-home points from this is aplastic anemia in pregnancy is associated with multiple complications such as sepsis and hemorrhage. However, termination is not required and it can be managed with good outcomes for both mother and baby. And what are the treatment options that are available? Thank you.